Now that we're able to quickly calculate derivatives, we're able to look at some applications of how we can use the derivative to model some real world situations. So our question is, what are some applications of the derivative? And the first one we've already kind of hinted at over the past couple lessons, but we're going to formalize our discussion around position, which we use s of t as a function to represent position over time, velocity, where we use v of t to represent the velocity over time, and acceleration. where we use a of t to represent the acceleration at some point in time. Now, we've already discussed the fact that the velocity is the derivative of position, or more specifically, v of t is equal to the s prime of t. And we've also discussed that the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. Or a of t is equal to v prime of t or the second derivative of the position, s prime prime of t. But what we haven't discussed is how velocity and acceleration work together or against each other. For example, I want to look at if the acceleration is in the same direction as the velocity, in other words, we're getting more and more push in the direction that we're going. If you think about the football player who's trying to get the first down on uh, third and inches, the players on his own team are pushing him as he accelerates in the same direction as the push. He's going to end up going further and faster. So the object is going to. Let me put the word the in front. The object will speed up because we're being pushed in the direction we're running, so we will run faster. And the opposite is also true if the, they are in opposite directions. Sticking with the football player analogy, you've got a football player running downfield, and the defender grabs him and pulls him backwards. It doesn't necessarily mean he's going to go backwards, but he's not going to go forward at the same speed because those forces are in opposite directions. So because they, the push and the speed are in opposite directions, it or the person slows down. So the acceleration pushes or pulls to either speed up or slow down. The question is, are they going in the same direction? So let's look at an example. Uh, the position of an object actually, let's, we're going to have two examples. So let's say number three's examples. And example A is going to be the position of an object in t seconds is given by 
s of t equals t cubed minus 3t squared minus 45t plus 7. The question we want to know is, when is it speeding up? And when is it slowing down? When are the acceleration and velocity pushing in the same direction? And when are they pushing, pulling against each other in opposite directions? Let's get us some space to work on that. And we'll attempt to answer that by first finding the function for the velocity, which is the derivative of the s of t. And the derivative there is going to be 3t squared minus 6t minus 45. The acceleration, then, is going to be the derivative of the velocity, which is going to be 6t minus 6. So we need to know when these are changing directions. When does the velocity change directions from left to right? When does the acceleration change from speed up to slow down or push to pull? And so really, what we need to know is when do they each cross the threshold of 0? Because that's when they change directions from positive to negative, from push to pull, from faster to slower. So for each of these, we're going to solve for when they equal 0. So with the velocity, 0 equals 3t squared minus 6t minus 45. And we can solve that by first factoring out the GCF of 3t squared minus 2t minus 15. And then continuing to factor, that's t minus 5, t plus 3. And so setting each factor equal to 0, t is equal to 5 or negative 3. Now, generally, we don't talk about negative time. So we're going to start at 0 for all of our time references. So really, we don't care about the 3. But at 5, things are probably changing at 5 because the velocity is changing direction at 5. Same thing with the acceleration. We want to know when that changes. So we'll make that equal to 0, 6t minus 6. Add 6 to both sides, and t equal, 6t equals 6. Divide by 6, and t equals 1. So something else of note is happening at 1. So what we want to know is if I make a little timeline here, something happens at 1, and something happens at 5. We're going to look at how the velocity and the acceleration are behaving in these time ranges. Are they specifically what we're interested in is are they positive or are they negative? Because that's going to tell us if they're pushing each other or if they're pulling against each other. Fortunately, this is really easy to do on our calculators. What we're going to do is we're going to type in the function for the velocity in y1. And then we'll type in the function for the acceleration in y2. So y1, the velocity, is 3t squared. We don't really have a t, so we're going to use x. Minus 6t, or x, minus 45. And in y2, it's 6t, or 6x, minus 6. Then we're going to go to the table settings, second table. And we can delete out whatever we were working on before. And what we'll do for our x is we're going to pick an x that falls within each range on this number line. So first, we need something between 0 and 1, because our graph really starts at 0. And we want to know what's happening in the middle of each of these areas. So between 0 and 1, a good number is 0.5. Hit Enter. And looking at that, I see that they're both negative. Remember, the, first, the middle column, the y1 is the velocity, 
The next one, the y2, is the acceleration. But they're both negative, and that's what's important to me right now, is they are negative between 0 and 1. Now let's pick something between 1 and 5, maybe 3. 3 falls between 1 and 5. Notice there, the first one, the velocity, is negative, but the acceleration is positive. So the velocity is negative, but the acceleration is positive. Finally, we need something past 5, maybe 8. We can pick any number past 5. And when I do that, I see that they are both positive. So the velocity is positive, and the acceleration is positive. Now we're ready to kind of interpret what we've got here. When the velocity and the acceleration are both going in the same direction, notice between 0 and 1, they're both negative. That means the velocity, it's going backwards, and the acceleration is pushing further backwards. Same direction, we're going backwards at a faster and faster rate. We're actually speeding up between 0 and 1. Then between 1 and 5, we see they're going in opposite directions. The velocity is negative, so we're going backwards. But the acceleration is pulling it forward. So it's starting to slow down and slow down and slow down because they're pulling in opposite directions until finally the acceleration wins and gets the velocity going in the other direction. And now they're both going in the positive direction with the acceleration pushing in the positive direction. So we're going faster and faster. So again, when they're the same, we're speeding up. When they're different, we're slowing down. So giving it as a range, this item is speeding up between 0 and 1 second. Union 5 all the way to infinity, it will always speed up while it's going to slow down between 1 and 5. Let's do another example where we can take a look at how the position of an object is changing, whether it's being pushed or pulled in the same direction or in the opposite direction. So let's say the position of an object in seconds, using t for seconds, is given by s of t equals x cubed minus 9x squared plus 24x minus 3. And so our question, our theme, is when is it speeding up and slowing down? And we can decide that by looking at the velocity function and the acceleration function and determine when they're pushing or pulling in the same direction or opposite directions. So the velocity, that's just the derivative of the uh, position, which is 3x squared minus 18x plus 24. The acceleration, it's the derivative of the velocity. So that's 6x minus 18. And we're specifically interested when both of these are changing between positive and negative, because that's where things are going to change. And they change at 0. So 0 equals 3x squared minus 18x plus 24. On the velocity, we'll factor out a 3x squared minus 6x plus 4. Nope, plus 8. Sorry, 24 divided by 3 is 8. 0 equals 3 times x minus 4 times x minus 2. And so this time, we have two solutions, x equals 4 and x equals 2. With the acceleration, we get our other key point by making it equal to 0, 6x minus 18. If we add 18 to both sides and divide by 6, we get x is equal to 3. So something is probably happening at 2, 3, and 4. So we'll make our little number line here. 
0, 2, 3, and 4. And we're going to be interested in what happens to the velocity and what happens to the acceleration. Again, we'll use our calculator to help us do this a little quicker. Hit y equals. And we're going to clear out the functions that are in here. Make sure you clear them out so you don't accidentally get the previous problem in here. The velocity was 3x squared minus 18x. Oops, x. Eighteen x. There we go. Plus twenty four. And the acceleration is six x minus eighteen. Hit second table. Delete out the old points. And we need something between zero and two. One is between zero and two. And we've got a positive, then a negative. The velocity is positive. The acceleration is negative. They're going in opposite directions to begin with. Between 2 and 3, let's try 2.5. Now they're both negative. Looks like the acceleration ended up winning here. So the velocity is negative, and the acceleration is negative. Pick something between 3 and 4, maybe 3.5. Now notice the velocity is negative, but the acceleration has changed to positive. So the velocity is still negative, but the acceleration is now pulling it in the positive direction. And finally, bigger than 4. We can pick any number bigger than 4. I picked 5. We see they're both positive. So now the velocity is positive, and the acceleration is positive. And it's going to stay that way all the way up to infinity. So we see initially the velocity is positive, the acceleration is negative. They're in opposite directions. It's going to slow down there. Between 2 and 3, they're in the same direction. It's going to speed up. Between 3 and 4, they're in opposite directions, slowing down. And then 4 on up, it's going to speed up. So writing that as a range. We're speeding up between 2 and 3, union from 4 to infinity. And we're slowing down from 0 to 2, union from 3 to 4. This particle is actually slowing down to ultimately change directions. So that's one application of the derivative position velocity, acceleration, speeding up, and slowing down. A second application that we're going to take a look at is in business. With the idea of revenue, cost, profit, and what are called marginal changes. When we say a marginal change in business, that is the change for one more. And usually, this is on the large scale. So once I make 1,000 widgets, if I make one more widget, 1,001 widgets, is it more profitable or less profitable, more cost, less cost, making one more? How's that going to affect my bottom line? And that can help us make the decision if it's worth expanding or shrinking the business at this given time. Because we're talking about change, a marginal change, which is a very small change, we can estimate. the marginal change with the derivative. Let's break down some of these business terms. Uh, we've got cost, which we normally represent with c of x. And we've got marginal cost. 
For marginal cost, we do mc of x for marginal cost, which is actually estimated, not actually, but estimated by the derivative of the cost function. We've also got revenue. Revenue, we usually use r of x for revenue. And often we have to find that because what we actually have is some price function that needs to be multiplied by the number of things that we sell. So if the price is $5 and we sell 7, 5 times 7, we've made $21 in revenue. This price function, the price per item, is often any, a, a function. because the price is going to be dependent on various variables. So we've got the revenue, and we've also got marginal revenue. And as you might expect, we use MR for marginal revenue of x, which can be estimated using the derivative of the revenue. And finally, what we're always interested in in business is the profit. The profit is p of x, which is simply calculated by taking the revenue or the amount of money we took in and subtracting the cost that it took to bring in that money. And we also have a marginal profit, or how much more money do we make for selling one more. So marginal profit of x as you might expect, is equal to the derivative of the profit at x. So those are kind of the parts of the profit function. Let's take a look at uh, some examples and see if we can wrap our head around what is this marginal profit, marginal cost, and marginal revenue. First. The cost to develop a product is c of x is equal to 500 plus 12x. Startup cost of 500, and then each one cost $12. We want to know what is the marginal cost of the 101st item. Now, a nice way to estimate the marginal cost of x is to simply take the derivative of the cost function. Well, this is really nice because the derivative of 500 plus 12x is just 12. So we'll estimate that the 12th item will cost 12 extra dollars. I'm sorry, the 100th item will cost 12 extra dollars because every single one we add to it costs 12 extra dollars. That's probably a less exciting example. So um, let's try, let's try a price function. The price function for the product, same product, is p equals 126 minus 0.15, I'm sorry, 0.16x. We want to know what is the marginal revenue for the 101st item. So first, we need to know what is the revenue equation or expression, function. Remember, revenue is always x times the price function, the number of things we sell times the price for each one of those. So that's 126 minus 0.16x. 
And if I distribute to make the derivative easier, 126x minus 0.16x squared. So then the marginal revenue of x is pretty darn close to the derivative of the revenue. So that's 126 minus 0.32x. And we want to know the marginal revenue of the 101st item. So we can plug 101 into this function to estimate it. 126 minus 0.32 times 101. And quickly typing that in my calculator, we'll get $93.68, which means after I've sold 100 items, the 101st item is going to make me another $93.68 or so. How accurate is that estimate? Because remember, I did say it is an estimate. Let's find out. Note the actual. because the derivative is just an estimate. It's going to be off by a bit, because the tangent line touches at 100, but not necessarily at 101. It's off by a little bit. So we could calculate the revenue at 100, how much revenue we've already made at 100. So the revenue equation was 126 times 100 minus 0.16 times 100 squared. And plug that into my calculator. We actually make $11,000. The revenue at 101 is 126 times 101 minus 0.16 times 101 squared. We make $11,093.84. And so if we want the marginal revenue, that's how much more we made for the 101st item, we subtract these, 11,093.84 minus 11,000 we actually get $93.84 is the actual marginal revenue. The 101st item actually brings us in $93.84. But much quicker with the derivative, we estimated $93.68, which is pretty darn close and probably good enough for this business to make a decision based on. We're not going to care about um, less than about 15 cents, 16 cents of a difference when we're trying to make decisions on our product, whether to expand or contract. So that's why it's always better to use the derivative, because it's quicker, it's easier, it's clearer to understand. The actuals just take too long to calculate and really don't make much of a difference. So we've done cost and we've done revenue. Let's uh, add one more, though. What's the marginal profit? for the 101st item. Well, remember, p of x, the profit, is equal to the revenue function minus the cost function. And the revenue function, we've got it up here above on part b. It's 126x minus 0.16x squared minus the cost function which was given to us up here in part A, 500 plus 12x. So distributing that minus, because we have to subtract the whole thing, minus 500 minus 12x. And then actually combining like terms, we get negative 0.16x squared plus 114x minus 16x, oops, minus 500. Keep things in the right order. And so if we want the marginal profit, we take the derivative. The marginal profit of x is equal to the derivative of the profit function, which is negative 0.32x plus 114. And we want the marginal profit of the 101st item. 
So plugging 101 in there, point, negative 0 0.32 times 101 plus 114. If we were to make one more item, we would make an additional $81.68, our marginal profit. I want to do one more application of the derivative based on where we're at right now. And that is in population change. Truth is, anytime you see the word change, we're really dealing with a derivative in action. Anything that changes is the derivative. So with population change, if we use p of t to represent the population at time t, then the derivative p prime of t is the rate of change of the population. So for example, if I have a bacteria population that is growing according to the function, p of t is equal to x cubed minus 18x squared plus 96x plus 20, where t is in hours when is the population growing and shrinking. We want to know when it's growing and shrinking. We're talking about the derivative. We're talking about the change. So the change in the population, p prime of t, the derivative of that function is 3x squared minus 36x plus 96. And where the change happens between growth and shrinking, growth, the derivative, is positive because it's going up. Shrinking, the derivative, is negative. It's going down. So it changes when the, pop the derivative is equal to 0. So 0 equals 3x squared minus 36x plus 96. And we know we can solve this by factoring. Factor out the GCF of 3 times x squared minus 12x plus 32. 0 equals 3 times x minus 8 and x minus 4. I probably should have t's, not x's, because it's p of t. I'll change to p of x, then it works. p of x. So x is equal to 8 and 4 hours. So at 8 and 4, things are changing. So if we got a timeline here, at 4, things change. And at 8, things change. What is happening with p prime of x? What is happening to the derivative? Are we increasing or decreasing? Is the derivative positive or negative? So again, we'll go to our calculator, hit y equals, clear out these other formulas. And our population is changing according to 3x squared minus 36x plus 96. And if we hit second table, we can try out a few values for time and see if this is the derivative is positive or negative. If it's positive, it's increasing. If it's negative, it's decreasing. Between 0 and 4, we'll try 2. We see it's positive. Between 4 and 8, we'll try 5. Negative. Bigger than 8, 9. It's positive. So it goes positive, negative, positive. Positive, negative, positive. So what that means is the population is growing 
wherever the derivative is positive between 0 and 4 hours, union. And then from 8 to infinite hours, it's never going to stop growing. And it's shrinking in between 4 and 8 hours, because the derivative is negative. So we're talking about population, business, and physics with velocity and acceleration, a couple key applications of the derivative. We'll talk about more as the course develops, but that's enough to get you going for now. We will see you in class to dive into these a little bit deeper.